What's up my boys, it's your boy Nitpicks. After just releasing a huge Doctor Who review, I thought it'd be good to return to my roots and review a Netflix original. I mean legit, I'm called Nitpicks, yet when was the last time I actually reviewed a Netflix show? What, like Darren Brown? To be fair, it's been kind of hard to find a Netflix show that's even worth talking about, since they're all so bland. Aside from that female prison one, Jailbird. But anyway, I'm not talking about that. You guys know Chris Lilly? Australian mad lad, winner of multiple awards, everyone's favourite comedian when they were 14, including mine. Well, he has come out with a fresh Netflix original, Lunatics, and I thought it'd be a good time to take a stroll down memory lane. However, the problem with your past is sometimes you realise you used to be a huge fucking idiot. Lunatics is Chris Lilly's sixth show. He's a writer, director, actor that strives mainly in his ability to play a wide range of different characters. He is a character actor with an immense range from elderly women to angst-ridden teenagers. The guy can do it all. These caricatures are large, with Lilly usually in heavy makeup and the characters mostly based around stereotypes. But this isn't some Little Britain stint. Chris Lilly has a unique fly-on-the-wall mockumentary form where most of his goose and gags are improvised. He attempts to contrast these garish characters with realistic environments, interactions with non-actors, and a long-form narrative structure where the characters change and grow. However, despite the global popularity of Chris Lilly's shows, he has felt the full scorn of the media numerous times due to the politically incorrect jokes and characters that often fill them. Lilly is a huge advocate for pushing the bar of what is appropriate to say and do on television, and Lunatics is actually one of the few shows he's produced that doesn't include black face or yellow face. Seriously, that's the actual term for it, which is pretty racist in itself. I mean, Asian people aren't even yellow. They're just like skin color. When comparing Lunatics to Chris Lilly's older shows, it seems like the guy has turned down his controversial approach to characterization, as this time he's not screaming faggot every 10 seconds or insulting any ethnic minority he happens to walk past. But even then, even without the casual racism or flippant homophobia, Chris Lilly still proves to be problematic. Because Lunatics fails as a comedy, fails as a drama, and fails even as a bland Netflix original. But before I get all aggro at a piece of insignificant popcorn media, I have to talk to you guys about Raid again. In case you didn't already know about Raid Shadow Legends, it's the freshest and newest and tastiest mobile game in the scene right now. Best 3D graphics, the best giant boss fights, the littest PvP battles, and hundreds of champions to collect and customize. Ooh, don't mind if I do. And right now, you can compete against me in the special online tournament that's happening right now. With insane in-game prizes and even real-life prizes that are sent to your door. Holy fuck! Raid Shadow Legends is completely free, so download this epic gameage through the link in the description below to get 50,000 silver immediately and a free epic champion as a new player program. And on top of all that, you can help me pay my rent. Seriously guys, I'm nearly broke. From an outside eye, Lunatic seems like a fairly original, unique concept, and it was in 2005 when Chris Lilly premiered his first show, We Can Be Heroes. This mockumentary centered around five characters, each nominated for the prestigious Australian of the Year award. Lilly uses the vague nomination requirements to structure the show. He plays all five characters, and we follow all of them in the lead up to the award ceremony. We see how they live, their philosophy on life, and what it means to be an Australian. This was a grounded theme to build around, as the character segments show the duplicity nature behind their good deeds and reveal that none of them are worthy of the award at all. This leads to a satisfying conclusion, with all the characters coming together on Australia Day and sharing in defeat. The only character that doesn't really work for me is Ricky Wong. This character is largely a vehicle for parodying the stereotypical Chinese overachiever, and Ricky isn't flawed or deluded like Chris Lilly's other characters. Ricky Wong was nominated for his work in science, yet that aspect is never explored. And while the other characters thematically resonate ideas centered around ego, service and morality. The Ricky Wong narrative is just high school musical but instead of basketball it's science. So you'd think 14 years later Chris Lilly would have ironed out the creases in this format, as Lunatics is also a mockumentary that follows the journey of multiple characters all performed by Chris Lilly. However this time he has done away with any guise of what the documentary is supposed to be about, or why it's following these specific individuals. The end result is an unfocused bloated mess where every character is a Ricky Wong. Lilly's last ensemble comedy show Angry Boys appear to have a similar undefined idea of its form, seeming to follow five unconnected strangers with no rhyme or reason as to why. However, 
Upon closer inspection, the clue is in the name, Angry Boys. Nathan and his twin brother make a reappearance and they are unquestionably angry boys. The eardrum transplant was a failure and Nathan is a misunderstood, frustrated teenager who will soon be profoundly deaf. His parents enroll him in a deaf school and Daniel prepares an overambitious leaving party where he invites three of their favourite celebrities. These legends make up the roster for Chris Lilly's other characters and with the addition of Nathan's gran who works as a prison officer for youth offenders, the segments are all linked through Nathan's leaving party and all share themes of masculinity, aggression and vulnerability. Though it's a niche topic for a documentary team to follow, this focus gave it a structure that Lunatics is severely lacking. But you could argue that all the characters in Lunatics are in fact linked together, because you know, they're all lunatics? Which is fucking dumb, because you could call any Chris Lilly show by that title and it would probably make just as much sense. None of these characters feel particularly crazy, except for this one who is actually crazy, but other than that, the link feels so strenuous and broad that you end up essentially watching just five random Chris Lilly stories that don't have any synergy or justification for the mockumentary format. With Angry Boys, what was being documented mostly was the lives of three celebrities and life inside a juvenile prison. As these are popular subjects for documentaries, Lily didn't need to explain why a camera crew would choose to follow them. But with Lunatics, you have to really suspend your disbelief as to why a crew would follow an ex-C-list porn star with a mental illness, or just some estate agent, or this bloke who inherited a clothing shop. Obviously, with the right focus, any of these subjects make for an interesting documentary. But as Lily is trying to balance six entirely different stories, the focus isn't there. Because we aren't given a reason for this documentary to exist within its universe, Lunatics lacks the pace of a documentary and ends up deteriorating into a standard soap opera with flat and overly shaky camera work. But if Chris Lilly has no justification for making this mockumentary, why would he even do it in the first place? Why not just make a series with clearly defined scripting and shot lists? Because that's not in Chris Lilly's comfort zone. The mockumentary style is all Chris Lilly knows. I mean, is all he's ever done. But as he's gone on, one could argue that he's moved his style away from mockumentary and moved more into the realms of neo-realism, while still sort of pretending they're mockumentaries. Lily uses improvisation and non-actors to build a sense of realism. He also never breaks character around his contributors, maintaining a level of immersion. This artistic process is to presumably enhance the narrative, to create more genuine and believable interactions between him and his actors. But this directing approach jarringly clashes with the the non-naturalistic characters he portrays. These cartoonish, loud characters with catchphrases and crass jokes don't tend to work alongside actors who are being told to act as normally and ordinary as possible. For example, Lily plays Gavin McGregor, a foul-mouthed, gross 12-year-old boy. He's disruptive and rude to his mum, but because she's an actor being told to improvise, she's meek, quiet, and barely responds to Lily's attempts at humour. The comedy is less jovial, it just feels abusive and you end up feeling contempt towards Gavin, as opposed to laughing at him in the same way you'd laugh at Eric Cartman. The character also has a crush on a girl the same age as him and shouts lewd sexual remarks at her as she comes home from school. This scene without context is a middle-aged man garishly sexualizing a minor, but if Gavin was played by a 12-year-old boy, it still wouldn't be funny, just a bit uncomfortable. It seems that Chris Lilly wants realism and absurdism at the same time. He wants extreme character comedy and characters that feel authentic and relatable at the same time. Chris Lilly wants to have his cake and eat it too. Because he isn't just trying to make an edgy comedy show in the likes of Little Britain or Kevin and Perry Go Large, he's also trying to make an engaging long-form narrative with character drama and emotional pathos. This is clear from the numerous scenes in Lunatics which aren't even trying to be funny. I've been thinking about transferring colleges. Listen, a lot of kids go through ups and downs. It's just a part of college life. From a narrative perspective, the strength of a mockumentary can be judged in the same way as how you would judge the success of a documentary. If I told you that I'm currently making a documentary about a seven foot tall girl who has just moved into uni, you'd probably be like, cool, is it just about how she's tall and stuff? And I said, she wants to make a YouTube channel and um, she'll probably argue with her sister a bit and get bullied a bit. She might even bang her head on things sometimes because you know, She's tall. Would it sound like I'd have enough material to make a full documentary about her? 
Keep in mind that this show is 10 episodes, which is 5 hours of content. I mentioned Gavin McGregor earlier, the 12 year old autist character. His entire story is that he goes to England to meet his uncle, who owns Gayhurst Estate. Ha ha ha. Gayhurst. His uncle wants him to inherit the estate, so him and his wife are like teaching Gavin about its history and how to maintain it. But Gavin doesn't really want it, and just spends the whole 10 episodes fucking around, pulling weird pranks with dildos while his cousin laughs along with him. Then, at the end of the season, he goes back home to Australia, and that's the plot in its entirety. I didn't skip anything out. There's no additional conflict, or big set piece, or change of heart. That is entirely what happens. But I know what you're thinking. How the fuck do you fill up five hours of material when you have two-dimensional characters barely doing anything? Well, you go environmental on that twat and recycle shit constantly, and try to sell it to us as character development. Yeah, man, let's hear that fuck song for the third time, because it's just so funny. Let's watch the freakishly tall girl cry and run around like an idiot again because it's developing her character so much. This makes all the episodes have a feverish deja vu quality to them. As you continue watching, you realize that each character in Lunatics has one gimmick and a couple of jokes that are repeated over and over again until you suffer from a blood clot. All their interactions are delivered to you like punchlines from a Family Guy cutaway gag, never spending enough time with the punchlines for them to move the action into an interesting place. Keith Dick likes fucking a cash register, and then he divorces his wife to marry that cash register register, and we get lots of scenes with him kissing and being intimate with the cash register. The problem is, is that it seems that the show thinks that concept is funny enough on its own to just offer to an audience without any purpose, so we see that same joke being iterated multiple times. There's no escalation with the joke, and it's only executed in the most basic way possible. There aren't gags about him arguing with the cash register or getting jealous. His infatuation is only taken as far as him fucking the cash register and marrying the cash register. We hardly see Keith Dick being confronted by the absurdity of his object philia, and it's never framed as something massively abnormal. At the marriage, all his friends and his ex-wife accept him and support him, which is a huge loss of comedic potential. It seems that without the permission to write racial or homophobic slurs, Chris Lilly's idea of shock humour is a guy fucking inanimate objects, a 12 year old asking women to fuck him, a mentally ill woman with a hoarding problem. If you want to make a series that revolves around offensive humour and poking fun at something which people might feel sensitive about, it needs to have a perfect purpose to it, a substantial reason that justifies why the humour is going to that place. For the jokes to hit, we need to be laughing at something that goes beyond the crass or offensive aspect of the joke. The fact that the drama in Chris Lilly's shows feel like an elongated fart wouldn't really matter if the man was jokes. And sadly, despite whatever my memory wanted me to believe, Chris Lilly is not even that jokes. Most of the time, the humour that takes place in the show only serves to further elongate the fart. Only now that fart smells like blood, so everyone who gets a whiff of it just feels uncomfortable and concerned. The jokes often put themselves in the realm of discomfort and tedium, because Chris Lilly only goes for what I would describe as edgy shock humour. In the past, even donning blackface to portray probably one of his worst characters, Smouse. I don't even find the blackface personally offensive, although it definitely is offensive, and I'm sure there exists a context in which blackface could be used for interesting comedic purposes, but this ain't it, son. With Smouse, it's like seeing how your parents interpret rap music, a bunch of ego, swearing, and the repeated use of the n-word. This doesn't even feel interesting. Nothing about this grabs my attention. There doesn't seem to be anything that even justifies why Chris Lilly has decided to black up. The same can be said for the characters in Lunatics. They're all as equally undeveloped and badly thought out as Smouse. Chris Lilly is still sticking to his 15 year old format and is unwilling to change it. And that's the real problem of it all. Chris Lilly hasn't evolved. His humour hasn't developed since We Can Be Heroes or Summer Heights High. Except now, he's so dependent on the formula of his shows that when you frame them against one another, all that you can take from it is how comedy and television has progressed and moved forward outside of what Chris Lilly does, emphasising just how static and lazy he has allowed himself to be as a creator. And that's really the most problematic thing of all. Lack of ambition. Because when you take your audience base for granted and you allow yourself to reside in creative comfort, Instead of pushing yourself and developing further, before you have time to realise that audience that you thought you could rely on will have abandoned you entirely. But what do you think about Chris Lilly's new show? Are you a fan? Do you think I'm wrong? Well let me know down below. And while you're at it, give this video a big fat thumbs up. Uh, smash the subscribe button. Uh, and uh, check out my other content. Uh, if you like this video, then you'll probably like um, my video on Sasha Baron Cohen. So check that out. 
Uh, thank you to my Patreons for being wonderful. Uh, thanks to everyone um, for the response to our podcast. Uh, the iTunes reviews are really lovely. Um, really glad that you guys are enjoying what we're doing. We know it's a bit out there. Um, but yeah, uh, we've got the new episode coming out uh, at the end of this month. Uh, it's going to be about British dystopian films. So uh, make sure to subscribe to Bleeding on the Page on iTunes. Oh my God! <gasps> you, you shot Gazza! You, you, shot, you shot him! Where's Chunkwee? I will never tell you the location of the prom princess, shit eater! You'll have to kill me first! Where's Chunkwee? I don't know her, I don't know her location, it, it, it's top secret! No one tells me anything! Oh, oh! Where the uh, fuck is Chunkwee? Uh, and also, if you want a new summer look, why not check out our fashion collection at nitpicks.co.uk. Uh, you can get a t-shirt or a sweatshirt, uh, you know. Just get something fresh. All of that goes towards more creative projects, which uh, we love making. So um, if we can avoid, you know, 